to now invite the uh, young Professor Zul to come forward and talk about the uh, developing human capital in the oil and gas industry. We have to do what we have to do. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Very good morning to all of you. I guess I cannot say salam satu Malaysia nowadays. I got to change it. Salam harapan to all of you. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Tan Sri Professor Gauch Jasmud, who has been very kind enough to invite me this time around. I was uh, one of the audience in the last uh, March seminar and also asking a lot of questions too. I guess probably that annoyed him. So he said, why don't you come this time give a talk? <laughs> As a second speaker, uh, continuing from what Dr. Suresh has just started on higher education about university readiness going for competitive advantage, yeah? So I guess today what I'm going to share with you, I've got 50 slides, but I'm not, I don't intend to, to run through all those 50 slides. But what I normally do in my adjunct professorship in other universities, I just put it on the wall. I just decide to put forward or whatnot. But I'm just going to talk from the heart. Yeah, 28 years experience, not really long though. Still, uh, I don't know. I, they call it still young, 51, but I, I think I'm old already. I cannot run for any Ketua Pemuda or what, what not, yeah? But anyway, <coughs> what <coughs> I'm going to talk today is about developing quality human capital uh, for the energy industry, in particular oil and gas, where I'm coming from. Uh, 28 years of experience, 20 years with Petronas, and 8 years in, in uh, GLCs and also regulators company, yeah? I think uh, you're going to hear from me as someone actually uh, come from a very poor family. My father is a laborer. My mother is a uh, nasi lemak seller. So I was, I was grown up in a very hard way, actually. I mean, a sibling of four, the eldest. I've got to, to pick up all the stuff on my own. Of course, at the end of the day, uh, I got a scholarship from the government that allowed me to further my study in California. I, I graduated from California State University in Long Beach. The daytime they call it Long Beach, nighttime they call it Long Beach. <laughs> That's what he said, yeah? So, what I'm going to share with you today, again, is my experience about, in particular, 20 years in patronage, solidly patronage. I mean, I, I, I've gone through under the various leadership, under the, ton, uh, the late Tun Azizan, Zainal Abidin, as a president, Tansri Hassan Marikan as a president. Tansri Samso Lazar, even though for a short period, because I have to leave the organization for another national duty at that time. And now Tansri Wanzul, whom I met last Thursday, one to one for one hour, heart to heart talk. So of course, I cannot tell you what did I talk with him, yeah? Uh, <coughs> Thanks very much indeed again. I think gaining knowledge is, is uh, the first step to wisdom. And sharing it is the first step to humanity. This is from unknown. So I guess I'm, I'm really glad that all of you uh, in, the, in the hall today, spending your time, sacrifices your time, just want to listen about what, what this adjunct professor is going to talk about human capital with respect to the energy industry. Yeah. Let me, let me share you with some background. Yeah. And by the way, the, the energy contact that I'm going to talk today, I'm going to share today, is, is mainly on oil and gas. Of course, there is renewable energy that I'm going to touch a little bit. There are nuclear energy, there are hydro energy. But for the purpose of time, I'm just going to restrict my focus on oil and gas, where I come from. Yeah. OK, Vision 2020. I think Dr. Suresh, my colleague, has been talking quite a lot about Tun Dr. Mahathir. I just, I just want to mention one thing about Turn to TM about Vision 2020. I think when he was out of power a couple of years ago, nobody knew that nobody thought that he was going to come back. So I got the opportunity, the liberty of sticking close with him for the last three, four years in my capacity as a technocrat, and his in his capacity as a 
former Petronas advisor. So for the last three, four years, when other people, other technocrats run away from him, believing that they're going to get you know, uh, grounded by the previous administration, I stayed brave enough to meet him out of respect because I respected him as a former Nicaraguan, no former leader of the country who have served the country brilliantly for the last 22 years. And he continued his service as the Patronas advisor, even though after he retired in the premiership, until he got kicked up on the 11th of March, 2016, because of the pressure from the political group. I don't have to mention which party you all know it, right? So I remember in the various meetings that I had more than 10 times, in, in, in Yayasan Perdana, in Yayasan Al-Bukhari, I think one in, in house during the function of Ramadan. <coughs> he asked me this question. I said, hey, Zoom, are you sure that you're doing the right things? Uh, when he said the right thing, are you sure that you're doing the right thing by meeting me, briefing me, making known to people that you're seeing me? I said, why not? Because my action is actually based on the trust that you are the former leader of the country. You are the one that who set the vision for the country. You are, you are the one that made the nation proud in the oil and gas, at least the, the, my area, when I was in Patronas for 20 years. So it is my duty to tap your brain, to exchange ideas with you, especially in, we got a lot of things to do for the country as far as the oil and gas is concerned, as far as the energy is concerned. Yeah. So while I was giving my adjunct professorship lecture since three years ago, in UTM, in some of the local universities, regional universities, I've been very consistent in saying that, well, Vision 2020 is something that we cannot forget. While everybody is talking about TN50, everybody knocked out Vision 2020 and all going for TN50, which is 32, 30, 30 years down the road. But I still believe that, look, how can we achieve 2050 if we don't achieve 2020? Yeah? So thanks God. When he come back, he won, and now be coming back as a prime minister. If I put it this, 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 this subject about Vision 2020, I'm not doing it just because he's coming back, just to please him, but it's something that I've been believing in the principle along my journey. Yeah. So when I look at this, this photo, it all start with a dream. A small boy riding a bicycle, looking at this this you know luxury car it's just like when reminded me when i was in patronas when i joined 1991 when i come back from overseas and getting the job as an instrument engineer and of course when you join patronas back when we joined patronas back then we are not in the twin tower yet we are scattered we're in the Daibumi, we are in the all kind of places by the way i started my career in miri sarawak i was i always i told myself i was the unlucky one while everybody else went to Dayabumi or KL Plaza, uh, I end up in Miri Lutung Sarawak, to be honest. No life. Goose city. But you save a lot of money. Okay? <laughs> and you save a lot of time too. You, you can go back for lunch. Even if you have sakit perut, you can go back and doing the business at home. <laughs> that's, that's how Miri back then. Yeah? So uh, they promised me three years, I end up almost five years. But that's all right. That's where actually I started the whole thing. And if I recall, when I joined that in 1991, we were just a small organization. And you know, we were forced, we, I mean, we were having a joint venture collaboration with Shell, Sarawak Shell Berhad. I mean, Shell is the number one company in the world, right? Imagine that Shell doesn't have any reservoir in Holland where it's originated, but they are the biggest company in the world in oil and gas because of the colonization. And that's what happened in the country. I mean, oil has been found more than 100 years ago in a place called Lutong, Miri. And then it goes to Trungano, goes to Sabah. But, you know, those days, all the benefit has been squeezed by these foreign companies. The ESO, which is ExxonMobil today, and also Shell, which is Shell, yeah? The, 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 the Royal Dust of Shell. Until, the year 1972, when Datuk Sri Najib late father, Tun Abdul Razak Hussein, the second prime minister. So I was told the story by Tinku Rizali, that's why I know all the story. So one day I met Tinku Rizali, 
in 2014, and I had a good session with him at his Langa Golf. I mean Langa. I mean the, this White House of uh, House Office of Hope, and he was the former first president and chairman of Petronas, and I was the ex Petronas uh, management. I left Petronas already at that time, 2010. So I went and see him and said, look, I am the Tengku, can you tell me? At that time, 2014, if you recall, there was a lot of hoo-ha about why Petronas not helping the Malaysian, the local Ibn Putra in particular. Why are they being left out? Why are, I, I mean, the scholarship are not being extended fully to the other bright Malaysian, you know? So I was very curious about it. So I went and see Tengku Razali. So Tengku Razali told me this story. I know it's being recorded. I can, I, I'm not too worried. I'm telling the truth, okay? Nothing but everything the truth. So he told me one day, he said, you know what, Zo? One day, Tun Raza called me to see him at his house, Sri Perdana, the old Sri Perdana. And then he said, Kuli has his fondly moon, right? He said, I want you to do three things. So what is it, that three things? Number one, I want you to take back all the concession from the foreigners, the Shell and the SO. They have been enjoying all this benefit and only giving us maybe a pity 5% yeah, of our asset. That's number one. Number two is from the National Oil Company, which is called Patronus today, so that the future generation of Malaysia, the student that Dr. Suresh talked about studying in the university, hopefully one day they can come back and graduate it and form the backbone of the National Oil Company and contribute to the agenda of the National Oil Company. And thirdly, it's very important to ensure that the proceed from the hydrocarbon to be fairly distributed to all Malaysian, especially to support, to groom the Bumiputra of Malaysia at that time, who really need the economy of scale, yeah? Without marginalizing the other, the other people, the Chinese or the Indian. So these are the three core where Petronas was formed. In 1974, they went to the parliament, <coughs> get passed by the parliament. The PDA, 19, Petroleum Development Act, 1974, was approved. Petronas was born, 1974. Then 1978, Petronas Charigali, the operating arm of Petronas, was born. And that's the beginning of the journey of Petronas. You know, I mean, when I look at this photo, of course, I can talk hours and hours only on this slide, okay? Because I went through it, I walked through it. And I said in 1991, when I joined Petronas as a young engineer, I said, we were partnering Shell, they have 60% uh, equity, we have 40% equity, but the whole asset belong to the country. Why we have to go in that kind of arrangement? We do that because we have no technical know-how, like you said just now. We are not ready yet, so we have to give in. Okay, you are the world leaders, you take the majority, teach us. Yeah, but I would like, I would like to believe they teach, they taught us, but sometimes they don't. Because believing that if they teach us faster enough, they can get out of the job. The contract is not gonna be extended, right? So we got to find our way, yeah? So that's 1991. We look at Shell as a big brother, and imagine, Today, in 2018, or even back 2000, uh, maybe two, the millennium, 2000, when we really penetrated and made a big deal in the world era of oil and gas by championing the, the deep water journey, by championing the LNG business, the gas business, so on and so forth. And we are actually then at par with the Shell, the ExxonMobil, what the late Tun Raza wishes to have, yeah? so. This is, I mean, moving forward beyond 2020, are we going to make our dream a reality by actually portraying ourselves as a Porsche or we still at Proton Saga? So that's the issue that this, that old man has when I was, you know, talking to him, picking up his brain, what actually is a real dream on Vision 2020, yeah? And this is another photo, really nostalgia for me. 
1974, with a budget, the initial operating budget of 10 million ringgit from the government. We are only operating from the longhouses, the wooden longhouses in Jalan Duta. I don't, I don't think it's there anymore. But look at probably in 1997, we have this magnificent, iconic twin tower, still the tallest integrated twin tower in the world. One man's dream, a nation proud, yeah? Of course, the story pre-election, so many things, so many malicious things, you know? I mean, sometimes I wonder, what will happen to this country? Are, are, we, are we going backward or are we not moving forward? That's why Dr. Suresh, my, my, my response to the earlier question why he wanted to be the education minister, it's not something technological know-how or, or fancy about it. He just wanted to make sure that the Malaysian are corrected again on the basis of the adab, those kind of thing. You know, you must know how to respect the old man. You must know how to respect each other. I think that's the reason. Yeah. Okay. This is the Malaysian map, the oil and gas, ladies and gentlemen. In case you have not seen it, but you know, just a quick note. As far as the Malaysian oil and gas is concerned, when they talk about Malaysian oil and gas, there are only three states that are blessed with the oil and gas discovery. This is Sabah. Sarawak and Terengganu. If you heard my home state from Malacca, say, ah, we, we found a Malacca, uh, oil in Malacca, we, we, now we, we deserve to get the royalty, that's absolutely rubbish. With the exception of Kelantan, I, I must qualify it because there are some dispute in the border between Kelantan and Thailand, but they have been developed uh, as a JV, yeah, JDA. So I think this issue of claiming a royalty might be true. Yeah, it, it depends on how the, the, the lawyers are looking at it. Maybe that's the first task for Tommy Thomas to look into it. Yeah. So even though we are not that big, ladies and gentlemen, half a million of oil production per day, unlike the Saudis, 12 million barrels per day, the, 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 the Russian, 10 million barrels per day, we are only half a million, small. But it takes a smart and shrewd leadership of the country and also the smart and leadership uh, at the patronage himself itself to actually create the economies of scale that actually uh, guaranteed us to what we have seen today with the iconic twin tower with so many you know plants in operation so many uh, grants or funding that can actually help the education and help, and help the research development and so on and so forth. Yeah, so that's what the oil and gas has been doing to the country named Malaysia. Yeah. So this is the snapshot about what is the value chain of the industry. It's, pr it's practically upstream and downstream. And I'm adding up one more thing called integrated services hub, which I believe, in the context of what difference could it make under the new coalition today that run the government with respect to the oil and gas industry. So probably the last plan, the creation of integrated services hub, could be the answer to actually <coughs> compete with Singapore, with Korea and so forth. You know, the Singapore, we talked about it just now, not even have a drop of oil. But when you know everybody cries fall when 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 the oil price take a drop more than 70 percent remember july 2014 when it all started six months down the road the oil price dropped from 147 us dollar all the way and one time it reached 30 barrel uh, 30 us dollar per barrel everybody suffered including me because when the oil price dropped to that low level Everything is upside down. No project, no jobs, no scholarship. Economic is, you know, absolutely terrible. Yeah, but our friends next door, Singapore, take example. They are laughing all the way to the bank. You know why? When the oil price drop, there no mega project can be uh, kicking off. What happened to the major op operating company, for even Petronas? They have to go to maintenance services. They got to do the refurbishment or maintenance and overhaul, MRO. 
maintenance, repair, and overhaul. And that's where actually they're making money. Imagine that maybe five years ago, should we have our oil and gas regional services hub, we were, we were supposed to be available, but it didn't happen because of so many politicking being going on uh, for the last uh, few years. You know, we can actually counterbalance it. Yes, we are the national oil producer. We produce oil to make money. We sell, we, we, we export the oil. But in the era when the oil price dropped, we can't move with the mega project. So we are actually being cut off with the income. But this services hub, it doesn't require any you know, rocket science. We'll provide the balance. So that's why I was, I, was, I was mentioning just now. I mean, GST, yes is one solution to provide the income, but that's not the only solution. And what more if not, it is not it is the income from those plans is not being utilized properly and wisely what it's supposed to be, right? To provide and to support the needed one. The, the, I mean, the students to study, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so if you look at this, I mean, for the lemon term, upstream in Malaysia is associated with offshore. I've been offshore many times and downstream is onshore. So this is what happened in the country. And again, I can tell you, being expert on us, we have a lot more to be done because there are a lot, a lot of blocks yet to be developed, to be touched. And this is again up to the next leadership of the country, with the, the, maybe with the new policy, how to spearhead and, and move this agenda so that the human capital, the quality human capital can be developed and can be given a chance to participate in the industry, yeah? Okay. When we talk about oil and gas, ladies and gentlemen, I think it is fair for me to mention that the good old days are gone. Okay? What I mean by the good old days? If you look at, at the far corner on the left, these are the initial field development in the country. We call it shallow water field. Shallow water ranging from 30 meters water depth up to maybe 150 meters in Malaysia. In the field in Sarawak called West Lutong, you can at 30 meters water depth. I was, I was, I, I've been there before. You can even see the fish. You know how how how, how shallow it is. We call that shallow water easy oil because we have a lot of pattern. We got, we got a lot of design familiarity, fabrication pattern, procurement of long lead item is not difficult. So that's a piece of cake. And we've been starting on this. In Malaysia, we've been starting on this since the day one. Until you move to the year 2000, the new millennium, where we have no other choice, ladies and gentlemen, but we have to open up and develop our difficult the water development feel that we are talking about more than 500 meters water depth thousand meters water depth something that we never thought before that we will dwell with this i remember in 1997 98 sorry i was asked i was still in patronage back then i was asked to attend a conference in Cannes, uh in in in, in france yeah so i took a flight from KL to London overnight and then get a connecting flight. Remember 1998? I said, I was so proud. I'm from Patronas. You know what it, this, this English lady said? I never heard of it before. And I thought she was very bloody arrogant. <laughs> and then her supervisor came. I said, what happened? What's going on? No, this gentleman said he want to get a corporate rate. He's from a national oil company called Patronas, but I never heard it before. And then I said, it just like your national oil company for, for the British, BP. Yeah, we know British, BP, but not patronized. Never mind, forget about corporate LP. So cut the story short, we went back. We, oh no, sorry. Then the supervisor came and said, ah, I know your company. All of a sudden, I was so happy. I said, how do you know my company? Oh, this is the company, right? That have been bailing out all the problem organization in, in Malaysia, the bank boomy, the, the proton and so many things. Well, you feel insulted, but that's a reality. And I learned, you know, the moral of the story, ladies and gentlemen, you were talking about brand here before I come to the human capital. You know, 
people know you. No, don't have to wait for the 1MDB for the last few years. People already know you for the wrong reason, even with patronage. Believe me. They thought when you mentioned patronage, ah, these are the ones bailing out the company, just like a Malaysian banker. But it is our job, my job, with a colleague in patronage back then, to correct it so that we will be known on the right basis. And we got it right. And in 2001, when the Chadian uh, government, uh, you know, they, they have found these 2000, they, they have found a big oil field in the landlock of Chad. Can you imagine 900 million barrel recoverable? 900 million barrel, the biggest ever until today in the record, which is contributing to 250,000 barrel of oil production per day. Remember, I said 500,000 barrels per day of national oil production combining Shell, Esu, and Petronas, Charigali? This field, this country, Chad, in Africa, Central Africa, can produce 250,000 barrels a day. And Petronas was invited by the Chadian government, happened to be a Muslim country, but they are the fifth poorest country in the world in 2001. Go and check. So, who are our partner? ExxonMobil, 40%, Petronas, 35%, and Chevron, Texaco, 25%. You know, <clears throat> probably if you recall those days, the, the earlier crisis of the, the oil crisis, when a lot of company got to merger, right? Remember? Exxon combined with Mobil become Exxon Mobil, Chevron combined with Texaco become Chevron Texaco, Total and Fina Elf because Total Fina Elf except Petronas, we maintain and shell. But you know, I was part of the job in the Chad Cameroon for two years. And I was sharing a room with one guy from Mobile by the name of Mark Sewell. I don't know how you pronounce it, but the name was spelled as S-E-W-E-L-L. -L, but I call it Sewell. I said, in my country, Sewell means gila. <laughs> he was complaining a lot to me daily in the, in the office time. He said, you know, Zul, you and I probably are in the same boat. You know, why? You are Petronas rep, I'm Mobile, ex-Mobile rep. Now we are working in the Exxon Constitution, Exxon Mobil. You don't like, you seem not to like Exxon Mobil, do you? Yeah, I don't like Mobil. You, why? Because when I was Mobil, all my logo is all with uh, blue color. Remember? Mobil? The old Mobil? But when they become Exxon Mobil, they change everything to red. He lost the pride. See how patriotic this guy is. I mean, about my age at that time, 30 plus, yeah? But I was so quick. In responding, I said, hey, Mike, you are lucky, you know. What do you mean? You're lucky Exxon bought Mobile and merger become Exxon Mobile. Imagine if Mobile merged with Chevron. You become Moron. <laughs> they say, oh, okay. So anyway, this is the landscape of today's oil and gas. I mean, those, those uh, easy oil are gone. We are now in the challenging complex oil development. And in the context of quality human capital, the one that my friend Dr. Shuris was talking about, competitive advantage from the universities. How can they prepare these new batches of, of, of uh, human capital, talent management, if they are not careful, if they are not being guided rightfully, they will fall in the trap. You know, I, I sit in a lot of interview committee in Petronas, in my previous company, in even ongoing. I can I can tell you this young, you know, young Turk, be it local university graduate or even overseas graduate, when they come back, just what you said, this is my piece of paper. Look at my CGPA, like I'm at Maslan, 3.8. I'm from UK, you know, I'm from US. Or even I'm from University of maybe Sunway University. But when you tested them on the reality of the game, they're not going into further by saying that, okay, you're an electrical engineer, right? I'm an electrical engineer too. Are you familiar with diode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You familiar with NPN diode? Okay, yeah. And then the, the sounding is getting sl slower and slower. I'll give you a piece of pencil and, and, and a piece of paper. Can you draw me what is the configuration of NPN diode? This is the overseas graduate. 
without mentioning which university. Yeah. First, he said, "Can you repeat the question again?" The English are all upside down. After again, you got. I mean, repeat, you got again. Then I, I you know, I, I said it, and then for the second time, he said, "Sorry, sir, I can't remember. You can't remember. You don't know. Just straight to the point." This is a reality. I mean, this is a simple thing to find the Malaysian graduate to be the backbone of the company, patronize his moving overseas during Tun's Dr. Mahadev's time. When Pala took over, he slowed it down. When Najib took over, with all the mega scandal and the focus is lost, we lost a lot of opportunity. And now, we turn back on. I'm really hoping that he can finish the old agenda. I want to finish my old agenda as well, as a old Santa Cruz. Yeah? Because there are a lot of things to be done. As I said, if you look at the block that I showed just now, as far as the Deep Warrior block is concerned, we are only opening up three or four blocks so far. There are about another 15, 16 blocks to be opened and developed. And Deep Water provide a lucrative oil discoveries and gas discoveries. You're talking about creating a job for the future, to be at par with the Shell in the Gulf of Mexico, to be at par with BP in the, in, in the, in the North Sea. There you go. You don't have to go far away. It's all in, in, in Malaysian territory, in, in Sabah, deep water, in Sarawak, LNG, business development, even in the southern part of Malaysia, in Johor and Malacca, where we can earmark them to be the next services hub for the region. I mean, what so rocket science about bringing all this proven contractor that referring, what you call it, servicing the valves, servicing the meters, what you need to do is put them under one roof, provide all the facilities integratedly, provide the incentive, and they do, will do it, and they will create jobs. My good friend said, Mr. Loga is one of the ex, uh, I mean, in the industry from oil and gas. He's in the work of a drilling rig. No other Malaysian have have brave, are brave enough to take up the scope. The closest is Singaporean, but he's there. Yeah? So, the landscape has changed. So I think those academicians in the room today, or even my, my, my dearest colleague from the industry, tell the message to the new generation, to the new students. The days that when you get out, you are, you are going to be provided a job by patronage, by some other subsidiaries, are no longer there. We miss those opportunities already, ladies and gentlemen. What will happen next is you got to be competitive on merit. You got to be evaluated on your strategic thinking abilities and your action oriented. I mean, Ms. Dr. Suris mentioned about the problem in the, in the country as general. We like to plan, but we don't like to execute. But I add another one. Not only, sometimes we are good in planning, we, we execute. But the biggest thing that I've learned through my 28 oil and gas journey experience, we don't follow through. We don't follow up. That's the basic thing that we should have done. I mean, you, you talk, you know, heavily, handsomely about, yeah, this is my planning about high speed rail train that's going to cost us 100 billion ringgit but nobody think about the risk assessment what will happen if i cancel the job is it worth it to pay 500 million ringgit out of nothing in a in a, in, in a track where 90 percent are located in malaysia only 10 percent in singapore you're being trapped by that kind of arrangement it's absolutely rubbish isn't it i mean that's one example but of course, in the oil and gas deal, a lot of deals. Yeah. So these are these are the things that need to to be passed on to the new generation, be it in school, be it in in, in colleges, in universities, because they need to know that the landscape has changed. Not only the landscape of the political landscape that that has really uh, made history for the last uh, one month, but the industry, the industry where I come from. Yeah, even at my level as technocrat, I've got to learn as well. I got to keep up with the technology, up to date, state of the art. Yeah, otherwise I will be left behind. Yeah. So, this is the very funny graph 
I will remember this graph for the rest of my life because this graph actually taught me a lot of lessons. You see, you talk about the, the formation of cartel, I mean OPEX cartel, yeah? The organization of the petroleum operating company. You can only imagine that before, there are only three major crises that you can always remember. This is for examination for your student if you are the education. One is the mid 80s, one is the 2008 during recession, one is July 14, until we just recently recovered, not fully. Today I checked the oil price, the brand crude oil price, $75 per barrel. And that's what the old man is saying. If we cut off the GST, we still have one source from Petronas because Petronas uh, gave a budget number to government last year, 52 US dollar per barrel. But today is 75. So there's some margin there, right? But again, it will only be useful to the people of Malaysia if the leadership of the country use it smartly and wisely. I qualify that. It is not meant to be wasted easily. Yeah? Because if you look at it again, the mid '80s, I was still in, I was still in school, so I missed that one. But I was told that two years, then it recovers. 2008, the the second uh, crisis. But prior to 2008, you remember 1998, the financial crisis, right? That was the first time the crude oil price, the brand crude oil price, dropped below ten dollar, nine point eight something, to be honest. We were all stuck in the office. No project to be developed, no, not even a medium-sized project. And we were told, you just hang on, hang, on, hang on there and do what you have to do until the brilliant leadership of Tan Sri Hassan Barikan as the president and CEO of Petronas back then said, look, he's an accountant anyway. Look, when we are hit, when we are low, we got to think strategically. And that's where he created the concept of small field technology. Meaning to say, we can't develop the big field anymore. Big field means 40,000 barrels per day, 50,000 barrels per day. Small field means 5,000 barrels per day of oil, yeah? So, during the, the big days, the 10,000 barrel, 5,000 barrel, nobody look at it. Ah, oh, left it behind. But when the oil price hit the rock bottom, we got nothing to do. What happened back then, we still have 40,000 staff. We cannot afford to lay off these people. They got families, right? So it comes the strategic forward thinking of the, lead, of the leader of Petronas back then, of course, with the prime minister at the time, detecting very well. Create the technology division, create the small field development. And for the next two years to three years, while we're going through that phase, find out whether we can create any pattern for technology that we can then orient, market oriented. And that's why we got PRSS, Petronas Research, bunch of PhD doctorate. We can count on the universities who has PhD. But back then, the biggest disappointment I have as a technocrat was, I'm going to tell the truth, you know. I'm not, I'm not sure to tell the truth. But this is the purpose of the session today, right? Lessons learned. Back then, the relationship between academia and industry is worse. Like, probably, Tan Sri Gaut used to tell me before, maybe you're going to tell it later on. The academia was always proud with research, then put it on the shelf, then and that. But the industry is crying for what technology can you provide, can you help, so that we can build the technology and help the cost reduction and develop the field cost effectively. So the effort wasn't there. Until only lately, you see this academia industry relationship, whatever you call it, whatever the term, yeah? But in my view, as a technocrat, that should be put in gear five. Regardless whether is it the old government or new government, to me, that is a political, and that relationship must be put in place, and in, in, in the search of quality human capital that we talk about today for oil and gas, then it will create interest. It will create you know, a lot of passionate to the, to, the, to, the, to the young generation. And this young generation, mind you again, have got to be the agent of change. They cannot be talking 
the subject oil and gas from the era of shallow water. Oh, what are you, I mean, if they go to conference worldwide. Where are you from, Malaysia? What are you doing now in oil and gas? Oh, we are doing shallow water. We build a platform, jacket platform. They, they, they thought they want to be proud of it. No, you're being laughed. The, the Brazilian, the Petrobras, we are talking shallow water, they are talking deep water. They are 1,000 meters, we are 100 meters. We move to 1,000 meters, ah, we are no deep water, they move 3,000 meters. They are always ahead of us. They are in the subsea. So, the young generation that I perceive the future leaders of the country, they've got to be the agent of change. They've got to be inspired with all this new technology. Because Malaysia got a lot of resources, untapped, undeveloped, what we need is the technocrat. And it's probably fair for me to say all of us got a role to play, whether we are in school or in, in universities, so that these people are being taught and being educated on the right thing, right for purpose. Mm -hmm. You don't teach them build a jacket when the fabrication only one hour next door is building a deep water fl uh, platform. Because you're going to be a clear mismatch. You graduated, you go and find it, try to look for a job, they cannot even understand what is deep water. So you got to be proactive, yeah? So that's why one of my job as a adjunct professor in the oil and gas industry for UTM, Institute for Oil and Gas UTM, I've got to play that role. Not only I've been in UTM, I've been some other university as well, even in regional, and today I thank country professor for inviting me for the first time in this prestigious Sunway University, yeah? Okay, I'm gonna skip a lot of things, yeah? Because, well, before I run to the, the prospect, these are the things that we need to know. As far as the world energy is concerned, just remember OPEX, where you got the big Saudi Arabia, where the big 2.6 billion I was told coming from, don't know where they can find the guy. Russia, the shrewd Putin, Vladimir Putin, I was told it's true. He was the one setting up for Trump to win. Shrewd guy. Otherwise, Rick, uh, what was the name of the, sec uh, the previous uh, Secretary of State? Rick Tallison. Won't be the Secretary of State under Trump administration. Can you imagine when Trump became the president, the first Secretary of State is a former president chairman of Exxon Mobil. I know the story because when I was in the Chad Cameron, Exxon was the big shareholder. Rick was his president. He's a sharp guy. He rubbed shoulder with Vladimir Putin and put Russia got a big gas asset, big oil asset. So nothing wrong to rub shoulder if you can be can bring a benefit to your company or country, right? China and India, do I need to tell anything? Tansri Gout talked heavily the last talk about Obo. And now we know it's all upside down. Yeah. But Jinping the, the, the president of China, I must give credit to him, he's smart. You know, there was an old saying, the old days, during the colonial days, the westernist colonial, when they went and colonized the country worldwide, the weak country, out of $10, they would spend $9 with the leader of the weak country, $1 for the people. When there is a change, a revolution on the leaders, they are gone because $9 spent with the leaders, right? Corrupted leader. But Jinping, under the Obo philosophy, this was told to me in the strategic close-door close meeting. He's a very smart guy. Out of $10, unlike the Westerner, he gave only $1 to the leader of the corrupted country. And $9 he spent on the people, on the infrastructure, education, healthcare, and everything. Something goes wrong with the leadership of that particular country, he still survives because he has put a lot of investment, think about it, in the context of our country today. The forest city, the so many things, yeah, the ECRL. And of course, no need introduction, Mr. Popular Donald Trump, right? But we can laugh, but mind you, he's a smart businessman. And for him to pull out from Paris Agreement the accord that being signed by Obama and other world leaders in 2014, 15. He must be very, very smart. You see, he put a lot of jam in the traffic in the highway. Yeah? And, and again, 
he's still a factor. As far as, I mean, this oil price today, I said 75 US dollar. There's no guarantee. If you ask me, if the reporter asks me, Prof, what's the guarantee the price will prolong? I, I, I don't want to answer that because I will then get quoted wrongly. Because it has a lot of factors. One of the factors is Donald Trump. Yeah. Regardless of what the American people say about him, what not. Yeah. And of course, North Korea, Jung Un, the potential of nuclear war. Of course, he is a change man today. Good to hear that. But you never know. Okay. In the context of okay, I just want to leave this with you. If you if you leave the room after my talk, and you remember this, you already passed hundred percent in my exam. It's a philosophy. If you control the fuel, then you control the nation. If you control the food, then you control the people. As simple as that. Why is the George Bush senior, why is the George Bush junior going to war with Iraq? It's not to remove Saddam Hussein. It's not to, to, to knock out the weapon of mass destruction. It's fuel, the oil, the fossil fuel. It's the oil. Iraqi oil is the one of the best quality in the world. Yeah. So Indonesia, I have a lot of partners in Indonesia as well. So when I have a chance to meet with my partners, they say, look, people always think President Suharto was a bad guy, have to submit himself, the country, to the IMF, right? But do you know, Prof, for 265 million population, he controlled the food for the people, he got it right. So moving forward, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I can have the opportunity to brief Biyama Burma Prime Minister next when I meet him. Moving forward. I met President's, President's President last week. I hope moving forward, we can't do it alone anymore. I know that's rapid in Pengarang, the 100 billion ringgit Malaysia. But how many Malaysian people benefiting from it? So just imagine 30 million of people in Malaysia, 265 million of Indonesia, plus minus 300 million altogether, right? It's a 300 million population that we need to take care of for the regional market. We can never go wrong with the fuel and the food export consumption. Just think about it, okay? This is the new policy we talk about. What are the new things that we can put forward? What are the new strategic things, yeah? Maybe Petronas didn't talk about it. I'll talk about it. Okay, three years in the limbo when we have oil price drop. We had a lot of complaint, and the complaint is not coming from the, 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 the netizen, not coming from the student, but also from the lecturers. That's the end of the world. Wow, that's it. 30 US dollar per barrel, we all gone, no more scholarship, no more things. Nah. But I challenge these kind of people in a lot of my agent professorship talk. Think about the three-year concept. What are those? We must see it as an opportunity when we were hit under this current oil process collapse scenario. Probably the fossil fuel development cannot be developed at the moment, but it gives us a scenario of ah, we have to think about alternative energy, clean energy. Re this is where renewable comes in. But we talk about renewable energy. What I didn't agree with the previous uh, government uh, uh, one ministry that looked after that philosophy. You don't talk about only solar power. Renewable energy is not about solar. Solar is only a portion of it. You've got to think about the bigger picture. The waste to energy, the biomass conversion. Malaysia and Indonesia, we are common. We are the top two biggest producer of palm oil in the world. Me and my partner, we were trying hard to win some job in Irian Jaya, in, in Indonesia, Ireland, on palm oil. So we have thought in mind that if we strike that, Maybe we can put a long-term strategy of renewable energy, yeah? Because that's the clean energy, yeah? So that's the opportunity. Think outside the box. Don't complain. Work hard. I mean, create, be creative. Second part of it, we must sound optimistic against a chorus of pessimists. I mean, there are people when, before they got a job, 
they were talking so heavily, so highly about things. But when they got a job at the oil price of 30 US dollar compared to 100 US dollar, and then all of a sudden you see the changes. Ah, oh, this is a problem. Oh, I cannot perform, blah, blah, blah. But then you are not a leader. A leader must be able to cushion that, right? So during the hard time, during the terrible time, you will start seeing the true leader being surfaced. If you can survive the 30 US dollar per barrel situation, $100 per barrel is nothing. At one time, ladies and gentlemen, during my time in Petronas, we were so greedy when the price hit 147 US dollar at one time in 2013-14. We, we were even thinking to set up a forum like this, like what Tan Si Gaud is, is organizing, to talk about the future of 200 US dollar per barrel of oil. See, that greediness chorus of God, because we are so greedy, God punishes, right? You should be, you know, you should be thankful actually with 147, 120, 200 dollar. Okay, what can we do so that we can maximize, we can optimize the healthcare system, the education reform, or not? We didn't do that. We thought, let's wait until $200 per barrel. Now we got hit at 30 US dollar per barrel. Everybody, everybody got upside down. And everybody started talking about, let's start again, all over again. So late, right? This is what I mean by the second O. The third O is be objective. Not only in your planning, but in your implementation or execution, but in your follow through. That's my favorite word, because every time when I was running a project as a project director, I said, look, planning, I'm not going to fancy about it. Yes, it's good. Execution, fine. But follow through. The ability to follow through and follow up. That's what lacking in most of us, the technical people in general. And students need to be thought about it. Because, you know, in here, there's supposed to be 20-80 rule, right? 20 on planning, 80 on execution. But we put it the other way around. 80% on planning. They say a lot of people get a good name, good benefit. But by the time you go to real execution, all the problems start surfing out, these people are gone. This is what I think Tonem is doing on the 17,000 political appointed position because it's wasting the company money, the, the country money. Yeah? Okay, very quickly, five, ten minutes. What's the future we are heading for? I talk about deep water prospect. We have got three development, Kike. Gumusat Kakap, Malikai, I'm so glad I was involved in all of them, except Malikai have it through. And these are all record, uh, world record for the country. Kike, on the far left, the first deep water in Malaysia, using spa technology in the Southeast Asia region. Gumusat Kakap by Shell, Kike by Murphy Oil, is the biggest in the, in the country today, 150,000 barrels per day. Malikai at 500 meters water depth. You know, when we were asked by Padanas management back then, Hassan Marikan, can you come up with a strategy for the team? Can you put Malaysia in the world map of oil and gas? So quickly we said, look, if you want to develop this technology, we will ensure that every different project will come with different pattern. Unlike Shell, in 15 projects in Gulf of Mexico, they only stick to one technology called TLP. So they've been doing TLP all the way. The moment you switch them to technology B, they are out. But we have set up all this infrastructure. So when I left in 2010 to take, undertake a new uh, national agenda out there, I was very pleased and very happy because I've done my job. We have set the pressure infrastructure, the field are running, the technology has been proven. All we need is the quality human capital again which need to be supplied from the universities. And the universities got to be up to date, need to catch up. You, can't, you cannot afford to have the university with the old thinking, okay, it's two hours teaching, that's it, whether you understand or not, it's not my problem, I got my salary, I'm going home. No. The professors, the senior lecturers, the lecturers have got to be responsible and accountable. What is the market out there? What do they want? Have you visited the site? I mean, I'll give you an example like Rapid in Pengarang. Three years, we clear the site. 
I was the vice president of MPRC at that time, under Prime Minister's office. When I got a job, vice president special special project. At one time, after one year, I feel I was wasting my technical capability. You know why? Why I say I wasted my capability? My job was going to see Orang Kampung, give charama. This is the good about this project. You make sure you can sell your land, we'll pay you at a good rent. I feel guilty at that time. <laughs> but little did I know, going to the side give you more inside information, right? You can talk, I can talk in front of you for hours because I went through that. I don't read books. I don't operate remotely like some other people. Yeah? So this is all there. What needs, what needs to be done in terms of mindset changes is get these people, get the students, get the, 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 the lecturers on the ground. If the student from Vietnamese, Vietnam, can take a flight to come to our yard to visit our deep water structure, why can't our, our student from Johor, from Malacca, from KL, from Sabak come down? There's no excuses. You want to say, oh, wait until we, the, the, the thing go offshore, then we go, no way. No way you're going to go offshore when things are offshore. It's expensive on the logistic, right? But again, our dilemma. Not Ton Mahathir dilemma, Malaysian dilemma. Because this concept of ta'apala. When can you go? Ta'apala. Ta'apala, we miss the boat. The Singaporean, the Vietnamese, or even people from Australia came down, they learned about it. Hey, now we don't have to go to Finland, we don't have to go to States because the structure has been built in Pasir Gurang. The crackers has been installed in Pengarang, in Johor. And there's a nice lobster there, by the way. Still didn't attract our people, our youth, our academician. It's really, really disappointing. Yeah? So, deep water is going to come, it's going to be big. Five minutes. LNG in Bintulu. We are the biggest LNG producer integrated in the world before Qatar comes in. Qatar, I mean, we were used to produce integratedly 20, 25 million tons per annum. We say, ah, we are the biggest in the world. Yeah. When the Qatar, the Qataris open up their biggest integrated LNG for 70 million tons per annum, we all of a sudden feel small. So never thought that 25 is big, you know. <laughs> Floating LNG. The first pattern by Petronas. I mean, I was proud of it. Downstream petroleum hub, rapid, and so on. This is what I was talking about. This is going to be my baby. The regional service center. If they can have it in Gulf of Mexico, in Brazil, in North Sea, what can we do it here? We can build. It's not a rocket sign. But my biggest concern still, going back to, where can I find the quality human capital? I don't want human capital. I want the first class mentality human capital and that has to start from now and everybody got to play the role not Tan Sri Gaut at, 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 at Sunway University not Dr. Shuris at his company not me at my consultant company or not everybody yeah then only when we are facing the rainy, the rainy days uh, once again when the oil price drop we don't have to cry because we can turn to this still making money and providing jobs yeah Asset decommissioning, floating, renewable energy. I don't. Want, I, I have to mention this, otherwise any Ujang will be mad at me. Yeah. But again, my, my, my take on this: you go to renewable energy, you go across across the board. Not only solar powered. You got to go bigger one, bio, biomass and waste to energy. I thought, what? A, I mean, this is not new. It's not rocket science anyway. From my experience, I just limited to this five niche quality. Got to be a big thinker, risk taker, decision maker, team builder, excellent communicator. We talk about it just in English. It's very important. You don't talk Malay when you meet with Shell, when you meet with ExxonMobil in overseas, yeah? It's a first class English, not even the Pasiputi English. And in my view, the industry need leaders who can face the challenge, who can adapt to the dynamism of the industry, passionate about work, who are willing to change, mindset change, and act as an honor, not as a worker. And last but not least, renewed level of 
intellect, thinking abilities, and action-oriented. Not only to plan and execute, but also to follow through and follow up. Then we will be there, inshallah, God willing. Okay, so last conclusion. All and guests are what keep us in our way of life going. It is the motor of movement. It is the engine of growth for any country's economies. Yeah, And we need a portfolio to cope up with the major change. And I'm pretty sure Tone Mahathir with a new coalition are well prepared because it's coming back fresh, right? So the portfolio will be in line and I'm sure you'll be supported by the good people who want to see this beloved Malaysia growing. And recognizing the political scenario as well, never underestimate Donald Trump, Kim Jong-un, and even Jinping. And last but not least in our context today is we must be ready to diversify our business so that the new human capital, quality human capital and talent management can come up and be part of the game. Ladies and gentlemen, hoping for very future. Thank you very much indeed. Perhaps I'll start off the question and so tell us, is the local university doing enough to produce the quality graduates of the oil and gas industry? Okay. This is really a, a tricky question from Tassi Gold. <laughs> well, in my, in my uh, experience in uh, Tansri, been serving as an adjunct professor in, in local university for two and a half years now. I still believe that a lot of things needs to be done. Yeah, if I put it in the scale, they say one, one to hundred percent. Maybe we are only at forty percent today. So there are sixty percent gap need to be addressed. A thing as simple as if I give you an example about, I was talking just now the simple analogy. We are now going to the deep water scenario. We are building floaters, a floating structure, thousand meters water depth. The universities, some universities, maybe it may not be all, some universities are still teaching the student about fixed jacket at 100 meters water depth. The student can graduate brilliantly with 3.8 CGPA of 4, showing around, this is my paperwork. But when you go to the interview, when Dr. Suresh start asking, you've, you electrical engineering graduate? Yeah, or structure? Yeah. Just tell me what's the difference between floaters and jacket. And you start, uh, 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 can you repeat the question again? You are out. You know, I trace back this issue because I'm a type of person who likes to go into detail. I probe into detail. And one of the reasons is syllabus mismatch. You don't, the, the universities, some of the universities are not teaching what the industry want. Yeah, even you talk about the LNG, I was talking about the, 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 the largest integrated LNG plant in Malaysia in Bintulu, 25 million tonne per annum. Now we are second in the world after Qatar. The evolution of technology is, is marvelous. Those with electronic background should find it very interesting. But if you keep believing the original technical drawing that where the LNG was built in 1981 is still the one that we are depending on, today is 2018, we are going to be left behind. So, in short, Tansri, a lot of, a lot more of collaboration needs to be done in the serious level. Again, it is not about a university. It's not only achieving the ranking, you know, chasing the ranking. Ah, okay, I, I see, you know, some universities when they got a ranking jump from 200 plus to 100 plus, they are celebrating that they are number four in the world. The National University of Singapore, number one for the last five years in Asia, right? They are super cool. But some of us still at 100 plus, yeah, celebrating for one month. You know, we've got to change that mindset. You know, the VC, the leadership, those kind of thing. And then the other thing is, throw away this ego, egoistic feeling. You know, you don't think that, okay, I'm university, I'm PhD holder. Not Dr. Shurish, because he got the PhD the, the other way around. So it's not for me to go and t find you to ask you a question. You gotta ask me what quality of graduate I need to produce for the industry. Break away from that mentality. You gotta be, you know, be very, very 
you know, humble. I'm Un from <coughs> Shah Alam. Lots of people say Tun M is a change, change man. And the question I have is, there's now also uh, the Trungano government has also changed. Yeah. <coughs> is Tun M going to give the oil royalty <coughs> straight to the new government in Trungano? Or is it going to be like the old days where he will channel it through uh, so-called federal agencies, you know, as happened in 1999. Mm. Because I'm sure the new MB there, whom I understand is an aerospace scientist, ex University uh, Patanian or University Putra nowadays, yeah. I I'm sure he can do something with the money to train some human capital there. Sure. Thank you. So that's my question. Thank, thank you, Mr. Un. I think uh, my immediate answer to you, I don't have the right answer because I'm not yet the advisor to him. But I can guess because uh, the president of POS and the MB of Trangano met him yesterday in his office. I don't know what they talk about, but I'm pretty sure the Trangano oil ro royalty is one of the top in the agenda. Yeah, But again, from the technocrat point of view, if you ask me, okay, if I'm asked to give advice, here's what I'm going to say. Because, you know, there is a agreement, they call it Petroleum Development Act 1974, approved by the parliament, yeah, whereby it says that if there is any oil being found in the respective states, the respective states are entitled to claim 5% of the royalty. Okay, you know and I know and everyone's know that why of this royalty money gets stuck because of the political reason, different ideology of politics, right? And that was, like you said, that was when the Tun Dr. Mahade was the old Tun Dr. M. So today, after he went through, after 19 years retired, and after he come back, in the process of coming back to, to change the Malaysia, he, I'm sure he, he, he went through, he's seen how terrible the country is when people start spreading lies, start, you know, I mean, the morale is gone, you know, when people don't have no respect anymore. I guess that's why I, w I was very confident why you want to be the education minister, because you want to correct back those kind of people. Teach them back. This is how you respect the elders or the, 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 the people, right? So I'm pretty sure being a change man, a wise man at 93, and in few occasions that I've sat down with him, I know he want to leave something good, a final legacy before he's being called by God. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure if this time around, if that subject come up again, but I'm pretty sure you will consider, and my advice probably yes, go and and and, and consider it, but ensure there is the proper trustees to utilize the fund and ensure the people in general specifically get the benefit out of it. I mean, get away with this political differences, uh, ideologies. It's purely for the benefit of the riot, of the people. And, and, and I believe him being him at 93, he got what he achieved now to help rebuilding the country again, Malaysia Baru, what we call it. And we're seeing that he's making the changes. And I'm going to things like that, when it involves the riot or the people, he will give you strong consideration, I believe so. My name is Ahmad. Now, uh, I think uh, there has been a keen debate uh, about what uh, university education uh, is all about. And at one extreme, uh, there is the opinion that uh, universities uh, to produce uh, people who uh, can think and so on <coughs> it's not for the purpose of uh, producing workers and <coughs> at the other extreme is the opinion that univers universities it's uh, the university's job uh, to produce people who are uh, <coughs> ready made for work uh, so um, now, my, my take is that uh, it is somewhere in between. Uh, 
but more towards those who are able to think and to learn. <coughs> I think it is uh, uh, not fair for industry to expect universities to <coughs> produce people who are ready made for job because uh, it's very <coughs> difficult for universities <coughs> to catch up with technology. Yep. It's different with uh, industries. So uh, this, uh, the, the kind of up-to-date knowledge has got to be got uh, not in the universities, not all of it in the universities, but in the industries. Yeah. So what uh, I think should happen is that, and if we are brave enough to change, is to restructure our higher education so that <coughs> our degrees do not take so long. Maybe we might rename it uh, to <coughs> something else because a degree takes four years. Yeah. I'm, I think two years would be enough <coughs> to be able to learn how to think, <coughs> how to learn to learn. That is most important. When they go out to industry, <coughs> they, they've got to be able to learn how to learn on the, uh, by themselves. Yeah. So uh, I do not no, you know how how brave, uh, uh, Tansri, how brave our uh, academicians are to, to to change, because if we do change, then mm. we'll be very uh, different uh, from the rest uh, of the world. But I think mm. that's some some food for thought for all of us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jaymat. I think my 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 take on that is actually yes, it's not the job of the university to produce a worker. Yeah, I think the word worker is not suitable anymore. That's why we revert to talent management, first class mentality, those kind of things, those kind of jargon. But in my view is, even if you have to wait for four years until they finish, then only they, they've been tested the real working life, right? The kind of thing that we need to twist and tweak along the line is, even the second year, third year, get them in kind of like GIT, uh, expose them to the side, you know, this shouldn't be this shouldn't be informality. What what happened from my discussion, from my observation is why it didn't work? Because sometimes the uh, administration of the university want to wait until it's become official. Then it didn't get moved. But I think if it, we're doing ad hoc, for example, hey, I've got an opportunity uh, for for one project going to be loaded out. And that's a good opportunity for you to see how's the process of lifting, blah, blah, blah. Come over one day, right? So we, we make it informal. I think if we can break away that mentality, we can cooperate with the university level, we go easy on the procedure, then I think it will achieve what you believe. When they get out, they are not surprised. At least they have seen it. At least they, they heard about it. Rather than purely on the on on a piece of paper, when the first time they hear it, when they go for interview, the terminology even they couldn't pass. Yeah, let alone have you seen it? Yeah. So these are things that needs to be need to be addressed in my view as a technocrat from industry, that in academia from universities, we need to sit down regularly, not in a patient like you know AGM once a year, twice a year. No. You gotta be very regularly, and you gotta be very candid. What's the problem? How can we overcome it? How can you help me? So that's the way I look at it. Of course, we got to sacrifice. I mean, when I when I went to perform my duty as adjunct professor, you know, there there are also university. I give you one true example. One university, without mention names, somewhere in the north. Sir, I've you know contact me through through uh, Facebook. Sir, I've got the the session ready for 150 students ready, final year students ready to attend your, your session, and and we are all looking forward uh, for you to come. And then I just said, when is it going to be? Next week, okay? Then I ask the next question. Fine, I'm coming, but just asking you, uh, are you going to cover my transportation if I drive? My, 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 my tools, my, my, my fuel. Are you going to cover my hotel? Oh no, we don't have budget for it. I thought you were going to pay yourself. I can drop the two hours uh, uh, on that token. That's fine. I'll give it as a sadaka. But for me to come all the way at my own expenses without being appreciated, I think that's too much. Because otherwise I will set a precedent. Ah, you call Ajahn Prof Zul, he will do it for free. You can come, you can go to maybe Indonesia. Don't worry, he pay everything. And I'm setting a wrong precedent for the agent professorship, right? So 
That's the mentality in university, I'm telling you. In UUM, I, I tell you. Now you know the VCUUM, so there. Right? Okay? So, thanks very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, question. <laughs> It'll be the last question. Yes, the last question. Sure. What's the name of it? Farida. Farida. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm retired. <coughs> I, I want to be a student. Like Professor uh, Suresh. Uh, I, it's just something that um, my own family member experienced, and I thought it's something that uh, the academia can think about. Uh, when my daughter did her degree, uh, first degree in architecture, and then of course she went on to the masters. But even at bachelor's, it's a four-year course. But after the third year, there's a break. You have to do one year of internship. Mm. So you actually go out and do things. And I think every course in any university should do that. Mm. And I'm saying this because I'm recently having a few uh, opportunities to opportunities to uh, engage with uh, uh, a particular university <coughs> and their course in entrepreneurship uh, the lecturers are all academicians so I say what about somebody like <coughs> it may not be me but someone who's had experience in in, in business in entrepreneurship <coughs> have gone have have fallen down, have stood up again, and, and so on. How about that kind of person? Actually, like, oh, uh, we can't because he must have a master's. He must, so how? Your course is his entrepreneurship. So I'm just saying. Lah. So for any university degree, maybe we need <coughs> longer internship hours. But they must remember that internship is they don't just absorb, they must be able to contribute. So in, in my daughter's uh, specific case, uh, the university gave a criteria, it's not one page, it's a few pages. You've got to go through this, you must have had this exposure there. And so the, the firm has to fill up all this and exactly what project she was on so because being architecture, one of the projects she, she had to do was she had to go to Meru. Okay, on a, a beach side front and things right. like that. But it's just an example. So, I mean, in terms of the university syllabus, maybe they can include this. Just my, my immediate response to that, Don Farida. Two words. Break the button or break the norm. I think you just said uh, you're teaching entrepreneurship, teaching business. But in, in actual fact, they are not doing, they have never run the business. They are purely in the paper, on, on the paper, right? But again, you want to bring somebody from outside, but they have this criteria: you must have at least minimum masters. And again, they know they know for sure. The more they put that requirement, it's not going to solve the problem. This is the issue I'm saying, mindset issue. I mean, they would rather stick to their egoness and 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 saying that student, for example, fail or not getting enough exposure, so that when they go and get try to get a job, they couldn't get it. Yeah. So, but a lot of things needs to be done, and I hope, Tansri, we can have a lot of resolution from today. And I'm more than happy to come again and sit down and see how best can we work it out for the interests of the country. Yeah. Thank you, Zor. Thanks Thank very much, indeed.